So good morning, everyone. Happy September. I hope everyone's doing well and that you had a meaningful summer and a nice long Labor Day weekend. So welcome to the chat with the expert. Today's topic will be social security disability benefits, common problems. And this is part two of our two part series with Rachel Funk. My name is David Knapp. I'll be your host today. Before we get started, I'm happy to present the Commissioner of the New York City Department for the Aging, Ms. Lorraine Cortez Vasquez, for some pre-recorded opening remarks. I want to welcome you to the second season of Chat with the Expert. I am Lorraine Cortez Vasquez, Commissioner of the New York City Department for the Aging. In the middle of COVID-19 pandemic, DIFTA launched our exceptional Chat with the Expert pilot with an eye for providing up-to-the-minute information and advocacy around the complex issues of ongoing financial exploitation and fraud. From the beginning, we wanted to connect our audience, you, with area experts who can provide detailed knowledge, tips, advice, and additional resources. As we launch this year's lineup of topics, I hope you will continue to find them meaningful as you seek answers to questions and solutions to the problems you face or that your family may be facing. We believe knowledge properly disseminated is power. I would like to thank our partners at PSS for their continuous support of this series. I hope to see you at the next Chat with the Expert episode. Stay safe, everyone. So thank you, Commissioner Cortez Vasquez. I just want to make a reminder that this webinar is being recorded. Rachel will not be giving any specific individual legal advice today. Please make sure your questions are more general in nature. Following today's presentation, a resource guide will be emailed to every individual who registered for parts one and two with all the resources that Rachel is going to be talking about. Throughout today's presentation, please place any questions into our live chat. We have Barry Langer back from a much needed break, monitoring the chat for you, all of your questions. After Rachel finishes, we will host a live Q&A. For those that are here today from a DIFTA agency, as always, please make sure you're using the link connected with your actual registration. We will verify everyone who's registered and is using their own individual link. And now to Rachel. I'll just give some, as I did before, some brief in info. Rachel Funk currently is a senior staff attorney uh, disability advocacy project at the New York Legal Assistance Group, known as NILAC. Previously, she worked at the staff attorney for the Northeast New Jersey Legal Services, where she worked in their public benefits unit, representing many low-income clients, many who were facing homelessness, loss of income, and health care. She also has experience working with clients in domestic violence setting and has dealt with a whole host of issues around child support and custody. In 2009, she received her JD from the University of Minnesota. She can give you more details about that. And now worth, without further ado and delay, here's Rachel Funk for today's presentation. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, David. Um, thanks so much. I'm so glad to be here. And of course, thank you for the Department, for the Department of the Aging for putting on this uh, program and for PSS for making it possible. Um, so I am going to be talking today about social security disability benefits and common problems that people experience on these programs and some best practices for what to do when these issues come up. Um, you can go to the next slide. Uh, so I'm with New York Legal Assistance Group or NILAG. NILAG is a nonprofit legal services agency that provides free civil legal services along with financial counseling. And we also do policy advocacy to help people who are experiencing poverty. Um, next slide, please. You can, oh, I, I missed our um, contact slide, I guess. Um, oh, here we are. 
So to reach out to NILAG, if you're experiencing a civil legal issue and you want to see if we can assist you, you can always go to our website. There's a little button for get help. You could also call our main line at 212-613-5000. And if you're specifically looking for help with a social security disability benefits issue, you can call our um, two different numbers. We have DAP intake available on 212-613-5024, or you can also call the main line at 212-613-5000. Um, and that information is going to stay in the chat if you um, need to look that up while we're going through the rest of the presentation. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so for today, um, we already had, a, a, as David mentioned, it was a two-part series. So we did have an earlier presentation a few weeks ago talking about the disability standard and the application process. I am just going to very briefly go through those again, just to make sure that we're all on the same page with that information. And then I'm going to talk about common issues people experience after they've been approved for SSI and or SSDI benefits, along with how to go through the appeal process and some important things to know about that. Next slide, please. Okay, so just to go through again, how to apply. When you're contacting your local office or the main social security number to put in an application, just remember you're going to need to gather together proof of identity, information about your household composition and living arrangements, the, your employment history for the previous 15 years, um, any kind of medical impairments, meaning diagnoses that you have, along with a list of your treatment providers, um, when you went there approximately, and any prescriptions um, that you have been taking or any surgeries, anything like that. Next slide, please. Okay. And then again, as a, as a reminder, there are two different programs for Social Security um, for people who are disabled, unable to work because of medical conditions. One is SSI and the other is SSD. I'll start with SSI. Um, SSI is the program for people who do not have a significant work history. It operates like a um, welfare program, essentially. Uh, so you have to be low income to be eligible, and you have to have a disability or be age 65 and over. Um, and then the income and resource limits we're going to talk about in some more detail. Uh, and as well, the difference with S one difference with SSI is that the federal benefit amount is based on what the federal government sets for everybody. Um, and that is also dependent on your living arrangement, who you're living with and how it's being paid for and any other income you have. Um, and then also some states like New York and New Jersey both uh, do add a little supplement to that federal benefit rate. Not every state in the United States does that though. So currently in 2022, the SSI monthly benefit rate is 841 for a single individual uh, plus $87 uh, from New York state if that person is living alone. And that's the maximum benefit amount that someone could get in the state of New York right now. SSD is a different type of program. It's also for people who are medically disabled, um, but this is for um, former workers, people who have a significant work history and who have been paying either self-employment taxes or having those payroll taxes paid by an employer. There are not ongoing income and resource limits um, as long as you're not working enough to be considered not disabled. And, uh, but we'll again talk about that in more detail. And the benefit amount, instead of being the same for everybody, it depends on your own earning history. Um, and then also the SSDI program operates like an insurance program. So you only have coverage under this program for a certain amount of time after you stop working. Typically that's about five years. And so you must demonstrate when you're filing for the benefits that your disability began before the coverage under the disability insurance program ended. And they call that your date last insured. All right, so those are the main differences between these two programs. And we're going to talk about each of them in more detail with common issues. Okay, next slide, please, Kevin. Thank you. So again, just to go through the medical criteria quickly, Social Security does a five-step sequential process where they're looking at, are you currently working and earning more than that substantial gainful activity amount, which for 2022 is 1350? Do you have a severe medical condition that's demonstrated in your medical records? Does that condition either meet a listing 
Or is your residual functional capacity so limited that you can no longer perform any of the past relevant work you did in the last 15 years, and you're also not able to transition into any other kind of work when Social Security also factors in your age, your education, and any work skills that you have. So again, that's disability. The disability criteria is the same for both programs. The financial aspects are different for each of these programs. Next slide, please, Kevin. Okay, so there are sort of two big categories for termination events for both programs. One is medical improvement, meaning that you are just simply no longer disabled or Social Security believes that your medical condition has improved to the point where you're no longer disabled. And then there are also non-medical termination events as well, such as changes in your income or your resources, um, and that can include wages or workers' compensation, other types of benefits like that, um, or changes in your um, assets if you're on SSI specifically. Um, okay, so next slide, please. So for the medical improvement aspect, Social Security goes through what they call the Continuing Disability Review Process or CDR process. Almost everybody has to go through this process at some point after they get approved for SSI or SSDI benefits. Um, and Social Security does this, it, it sort of it depends on the medical conditions you have. Typically, they do it about once every three to seven years, but it can be more frequent and they do have discretion to do it as frequently as they want. Um, and sometimes people go for a very long time without having one and then are very surprised when they get a letter. Um, but what happens is you get a letter in the mail that says, we are starting a continuing disability review. You need to fill out all of these forms that we're sending you to let us know what is your current medical condition? Where are you going for treatment now? What prescriptions are you taking now? Have you had any kind of testing, any kind of imaging? Have you had any surgeries? Have you gone to any hospitals? You fill out all of those forms and you need to return them to the social security office. And here is where the first big problem often comes up with these types of cases. Uh, well, two problems come up at this point. One is that people frequently don't get this letter with the forms, either because they haven't been checking their mail frequently or because they're having trouble with their mail or for some reason it didn't get delivered to them. Um, so if you don't receive the forms, then of course you can't return them. And now we can go to the next slide. So common problems, failure to cooperate, which means that social security sent you forms that they didn't get back from you, either because you didn't get them or because you sent them back in a way that they decided wasn't good enough or something like that. So they call this failure to cooperate. If they don't get the forms back from you by the deadline, they will then stop your payments um, so to kind of prompt you to contact them to start the process. So what might happen is you might all of a sudden no longer have your benefits on the first of the month or whatever your usual payment date is. And then you need to contact your local office to find out what happened. Um, if they say they sent you paperwork and you didn't get it, then they can send it to you again and they should reinstate your benefits while they're waiting for you to send it back this next time. So best practices for these circumstances are one, to check your mail frequently, to understand that even though this is a permanent disability program, Social Security does send periodic mail that you need to respond to, to maintain those benefits. Um, when you fill out the forms, keep copies of every single form that you fill out. And then when you return the forms to Social Security, they will send you a little yellow envelope. You can put everything back in. I typically don't recommend doing that because it can get lost in their mail room. And then you might miss the deadline just because they haven't opened it yet. So I always recommend returning the forms by fax or in person so that you have that confirmation that you sent it in. So those are some best practices for this issue of failure to cooperate. Um, and again, keeping copies of what you sent to them will show that you met the deadline if you have your confirmation. And also if you have to send it again, it'll be really easy just to make another copy instead of having to fill all those forms out again. Okay, next slide, please. 
Okay, so once you've gone through the CDR process, you will get another letter in the mail saying, we've either found that your disability continues or we think your disability has ceased as effective whatever month it is. They will keep paying you for two months following notice. Then after that, then they will stop your benefits uh, on a permanent basis. So next slide, please. Um, you have the option, oh, well, we'll talk about appeals later, but if they decide they're gonna stop your benefits, you'll appeal it and we can do, we can talk more about that in detail later. Um, the CDR process is pretty much the only kind of specifically medical way that benefits get terminated. So SSDI non-medical termination events have to do with income typically. So that could be earnings from work in excess of the limits or unearned income that results in an offset of your benefits. So next slide, please. <clears throat> you as the recipient or a representative payee for a recipient have the obligation under both programs to report your income, your resources, your living arrangement, your household composition, and any other non-medical factor that might affect your eligibility. Um, they send letters all the time letting you know you need to make these reports, and you do have to do it on an ongoing basis. So um, you can make those reports by phone, online, or in person. Um, typically, this comes up um, for people either because they've started working and they don't realize they need to report to Social Security that they're working. Um, the government seems like it knows that you're working because, of course, taxes are being paid, but the IRS and Social Security do not communicate very frequently. So you can't rely on the IRS to notify Social Security that you started working, and Social Security's rules say that you have to do that yourself. Um, you, they have set up an app that you can use to report work earnings, um, and you can do it online relatively simply. The other best practice is to keep any copies of your pay stubs that you receive. If you have direct deposit, then typically the employer sends you pay stubs um, electronically, um, and you should keep those somewhere on your computer uh, so that you can provide them to Social Security if any issues come up. Next slide, please. Okay, so SSDI has a very complicated work um, system, basically. You are allowed to work and receive disability benefits under the SSDI program, but you have to be very careful about how much you're earning. Um, when you first start working with Social Security disability benefits, you have a nine-month period that's called a trial work period, and that is nine non-consecutive months, and it's any month that you have earnings over $970 in 2022, um, that will trigger a trial work period month. So if you have earnings in that month gross of 970 or more than 970, then that will be a trial work period month and it will subtract from your total of nine months that you can have. During the trial work period, you can earn any amount of money and still receive your full benefit amount but it does tick down this clock of the nine months and you move closer to what's called the next stage once these nine months are up. So next slide, Kevin. At the end of your trial work period, the, the 10th month following your nine months, then you start what's called the extended period of eligibility or EPE period. During this time period, it's 36 calendar months. So now it's consecutive months. Um, and any month that you have gross earnings at or over the SGA, the substantial gainful activity amount, you're not eligible for your SSDI in that month. Any month that your earnings are below that level, then you are eligible for your full SSDI benefit. So there's no offset here. It's just you're getting your full benefits or you're not getting your full benefits. And it all depends whether your gross earnings are over that SGA amount or below that SGA amount. And I'm sorry, I do have some, I'm recovering from a cold, so I apologize for the sniffing here. <laughs> um, currently in 2022, the SGA amount is 1,350. And again, that is per month and that is gross. 
you are allowed to subtract what's called ERWI. These are expenses that you have because of your disability that allow you to work. Um, typical examples might be if you need special transportation to get to work because of your medical conditions, um, if you need certain materials you know, that help you do the work that you have to pay for, you can subtract those costs from your gross earnings um, to find out how much your countable earnings will be for the month. Another common example is if you're in a supported work environment where someone is assisting you with doing the work that you're doing, you, you need to be able to demonstrate this from the employer, but the employer should be able to say, given their program, how much work you are actually doing versus the person who is helping you do the work and then calculate how much your actual wages are as a result of that. Okay, so some common problems that come up with this is that people who get paid bi-weekly or every two weeks, you might have a month in which you're getting three paychecks. So it looks like your earnings are much higher for that month. And then you lose benefits for that month. Um, for SSDI under Social Security's rules, your earnings count when you earn them. So the day you're actually doing the work is when they're supposed to count. But to simplify everything, Social Security is able to just assume that when you get paid is when you did the work, essentially. So they don't have to go through that whole um, calculation to see what it is every day, but you keeping your pay stubs, you're going to see what the pay period is that covers that paycheck. And you should be able to demonstrate from that which days are actually in which month, which days you're getting paid for in which month. The other way to kind of avoid this is make sure that your overall earnings are low enough that even in those months that you're getting um, you know, a third paycheck, you're still below this SGA limit for that month, and then you wouldn't have to worry about it. Uh, other common problems that come up is sometimes people work overtime and they don't realize that that is putting them over this 1350, where um, people might take on an extra shift or two, and you just want to be really, really careful when you're doing something like that. You need to really make sure how much you're, you're going to be earning to, in doing that extra work to make sure you're staying below this level so you don't face an overpayment. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so what happens at the end of the 36 months of your extended period of eligibility? You start into your expedited reinstatement or EXR period. This is again a five-year period, calendar um, sequential, starts at the end of your EPE, and during this five-year period, if you, if unlike the EPE, when you can go on and off benefits, depending on how much your earnings are, in the EXR period, any month your gross earnings are over the SGA limit, your SSDI terminates completely. So you don't get to go back on and off again anymore. You just are done with the benefits. Um, if your earnings then fall below the SGA limit, you can reapply on an expedited basis. So you're, it's a slightly shorter application than a fully new application. And you're also permitted to get provisional benefits for up to six months while they're reviewing your application. So you can get them benefits on a temporary basis while they're looking through your application. If they ultimately approve your expedited reinstatement application, then you, you know, there's no problem with those provisional benefits. If they decide to deny it, then you will have an overpayment for whatever provisional benefits you received. Okay, next slide. So other ways that you can lose SSDI benefits in a month is with certain types of unearned income. Um, typically, I see that come up in the workers' compensation realm. There is a calculation that Social Security does to offset your SSDI benefits if you've received workers' compensation. Um, it's not dollar for dollar, it's a little bit complicated and it's hard to know what to expect, especially since oftentimes people receive a settlement at the end of a workers' compensation claim that covers a previous time period. So main things to know about this is just, if you're getting workers' compensation benefits, you need to report it to Social Security so they can do this calculation. If you receive a settlement at some point, you need to report that to Social Security so they can do any calculation and you might end up with an overpayment. 
and we're going to talk about that later. Um, so the other way that SSDI benefits can be reduced to zero is for recoupment of an overpayment. Under SSDI's rules, Social Security is permitted to withhold your entire monthly benefit to repay an overpayment from another time period. However, if you set up a payment plan with them, they will just work on whatever the payment plan is and you'll be able to keep the rest of your benefits. Okay, next slide, Kevin. Okay, so excuse me, that was SSDI. So now SSI has other non-medical termination events. So again, CDR process medical improvement is the same for both programs, but they have different financial limitations. So for SSI, you can lose benefits for earned income, for unearned income, for excess resources or assets. Um, and you can have your benefits reduced or eliminated because of a living arrangement change. Next slide, please. Thanks, Kevin. Um, okay, so for SSI, there's a very different calculation when it comes to your earned income. Um, once you have your earnings, then Social Security subtracts $20 every month. Then if it's earned income from a job, they also subtract $65 every month. And then they count 50% of what's left and they subtract that from your monthly SSI benefit. So just depending on how that math works out, you might receive a lower amount of your SSI benefit for that month or your benefit might be reduced to zero. And again, the same reporting requirements um, are involved for SSI, so you do need to report your income in an ongoing basis from work. Next slide, please. Unearned income for SSI, you get the same $20 exclusion, but you do not get that $65 exclusion, and they don't count only 50%, they just count all of it, and then they reduce your benefit by that unearned income amount. So again, depending on how much your unearned income is, then that might reduce your benefit by um, however many dollars that is. Um, unearned income, again, is something like uh, workers' compensation or if you receive um, some other type of benefit, other income from another person, somebody is you know, paying you a pension from an old job that you had a long time ago, something like that. The other um, context that comes up here a lot is what's called in-kind support and maintenance. So in-kind support and maintenance is not going to eliminate an SSI benefit, but it will reduce an SSI benefit. Under the SSI rules, because the federal government treats it as a welfare program, uh, if someone is helping you with your living expenses, then that will reduce your SSI benefit. Um, so that means if you're not paying your own rent or if you're not paying your full pro rata share of the rent, then Social Security will typically reduce your benefit by about a third, um, or they will reduce it by the actual dollar amount of the assistance. It just depends on which is better for you. So for most people, that third is the better amount, and that can reduce your benefits from $841 a month to you know, $600 a month or something like that. You can avoid in-kind support and maintenance reductions by putting yourself in a living situation where you are able to pay your full share of the rent. Either you, know, you and a roommate split the rent, um, or if you have, you know, you're living with family, you can figure out how much the room that you're renting should cost and then set up a written agreement with your family member so that um, you're paying your full share of the expenses. Um, or you can, you know, you can talk with your family that you're living with. It might work out better for you financially for you to actually have this reduction and have the uh, additional assistance. It just depends. Um, so that's a, a, a common issue that comes up. And again, that's why you are required to report your living arrangement, who's living with you and how it's being paid for um, to Social Security. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so the other um, main thing that comes up for SSI termination events are resources or assets. Um, for a single individual, the limit in resources is $2,000 as of the very first moment of the first of the month. That's when they count it. For a couple, it is $3,000. Um, so a couple living uh, together have a limit of $3,000. 
the resources roughly means assets, and that means money that you have at home in cash, money you have in the bank, money you have in any kind of investment account, money that exists in a joint account, which is a problem that comes up a lot, um, any property you own other than the home you're living with, um, anything more than one car for yourself, a life insurance cash surrender value, another thing that comes up a lot, or a savings bond. So I just want to highlight joint accounts are frequently a problem for um, disabled or elderly individuals because a lot of times they'll have a family member who wants to make sure that they are covered in case something happens to that family member. So they'll do a joint account as sort of a in case of emergency account. Social security assumes that any account with your name on it is your money. So if you want to do a joint account with um, someone who's receiving SSI benefits, you need to be very careful that that person does not actually access that account. And you need to provide documentation to Social Security that even though that person's name is on the account, they never actually use the account. It's really much, much simpler for you to not do a joint account with the person who's receiving SSI benefits. They can get into a, a lot of um, sticky wickets, as it were. So better to try to set up a different system if you're worried about the person not having access to money in case something happens. The other off, uh, frequent thing that comes up that I see is life insurance cash surrender values. Um, there are two different kinds of life insurance prop, um, uh, accounts or life insurance is. <laughs> One is whole life insurance, which does have a cash surrender value, and the other is term life insurance. It's hard to know the difference when you're purchasing a policy, but essentially the, the one that's gonna cause you a problem is the one that builds up a savings component because that savings component is counted as a resource for you. And all of these things together have to be $2,000 or less as of the first of every month so that for you to be eligible for your benefits. So again, a lot of people um, would like to have you know, a small life insurance policy just to cover funeral expenses. You can certainly do that. Um, you know, try to make sure that you're getting a term life insurance policy if that's what you want to do. Or you could also set up a, a burial fund. And that's going to be in the materials that I send out. Okay, next slide, Kevin. Kevin. <laughs> okay, so there are some things excluded from resources. Um, in addition to property that you're living in, um, or your own car, the stimulus payments that people received in 2020 and 21. Um, uh, can I will answer that question just really briefly. So a trust fund has to be has to fall within very specific um, parameters to be excluded from SSI resources. Um, you basically have to follow the Medicaid rules for a trust to be excluded. Um, and that's something you should really work with. Uh, I would recommend working with an attorney on. You can contact NILAG for advice about that. We do have a Medicaid unit that sometimes can assist with setting those up, or we can refer to private attorneys who do these types of things a lot. But you want to be very careful with a trust fund. Okay, so stimulus payments, um, as long as they stayed in the bank, are excluded. And federal tax refunds are excluded for 12 months following their receipt. And also retroactive SSI or SSDI benefits are excluded for nine months following their receipt. Um, so for all of these things, just keep copies of your records in case something comes up with Social Security, you can provide the proof that this was either tax refund or a stimulus payment or your retroactive benefits. Okay, next slide, Kevin. Hi, Rachel, for one yeah. second. I, mm -hmm. I just wanted to mention that we will also be having a pooled income trust, a, a trust with um, Taya Bishop, also from oh. um, Nyleg, like later in um, the fall. So if anyone's interested, um, they could bring up that question directly with her. So. That's Yeah, that's excellent. Um, and again, if you need to get in touch with Nyleg to ask questions, the information about contacting Nyleg is in the chat. So you can just copy paste it from there. Okay. All right, so having talked about, of course, <laughs> having talked about these termination events, um, so one thing that frequently happens as well is Social Security realizes that someone has become ineligible for benefits, either for a medical or non-medical reason, uh, at some point in the recent past. And what that will do is cause an overpayment. 
Um, if something is, um, you know, within the most recent couple of years, Social Security is able to charge the recipient for benefits that that person received when they were not eligible. Um, you can certainly appeal an overpayment notice. Um, you can file reconsideration and you can also request what's called a waiver. Um, so a waiver is not an appeal. A waiver is an admission that the overpayment is correct, that the person was not eligible for those benefits when they received them and that they did actually receive them. But it is a um, request that Social Security in its discretion not charge you for that overpayment because it wasn't your fault that you received the overpayment and because um, you're not able to afford to pay it back. So the fault requirement um, can be very hard to meet because Social Security really holds people to a pretty high standard in saying that you need to be on the ball with reporting to them about any income or resources um, or um, you know, other events that take place that can eliminate your benefits. So that's why you need to be sure that you're reporting very consistently to Social Security and also keeping proof of the reports that you're making, whether that is you know, bringing it in person and keeping your um, the little ticket they give you or sending it to them in writing by fax and keeping your fax confirmation. Um, you wanna be very careful and diligent about keeping track of all of the times that you contact social security because you cannot assume that they will have it in their records. So really best practices again would be to have just a separate folder in your house where you know where it always is, where you put everything all communications that you make to Social Security goes in that folder and you can pull it out at any time that they think that you haven't done what you were supposed to do. Um, and then as far as the ability to repay, it depends on your program that you're receiving benefits from. For SSI, they assume, the rules say they're supposed to assume that you are not able to afford to pay it back because SSI is a low income program. For SSDI, you will have to fill out in the waiver form your income, assets, and your expenses and show Social Security if there's anything left over that you would be able to do a payment plan with. Um, if you don't want to request a waiver or an appeal, then you could also do a payment plan where you just set up however much you're able to afford to pay back every month. Um, again, as far as best practices go, always do your appeal first because you have a time limit to do an appeal. A waiver request does not have a time limit. So you can always do that later and you wanna be sure that your overpayment is correct before you ask for a waiver um, because you sort of only really get one waiver in your lifetime. Um, if a different circumstance comes up, then you can get another waiver, but it's very hard to get a second waiver. Okay. so. Next slide, please. Okay, so appeals, right? There are time limits for appeals again, um, and it depends on the program a little bit. So for SSDI terminations, if you want to be sure that you continue to receive your benefits um, while your appeal is, is pending, you need to appeal within 10 days of the receipt of the notice or 15 days from when they notified you. Otherwise, you have uh, the usual 60-day time period to um, appeal it. If you do ask that your benefits keep getting paid to you while you're waiting for the decision on the appeal, if the appeal is decided against you, then you will be overpaid for those months that you received the continued benefits for. So it might add to your overpayment and you will have to acknowledge to Social Security that you understand that's a risk when you ask for those benefits to keep getting continued. That's for the SSDI program. For SSI terminations, as long as you file your appeal within 60 days of your receipt of the notice or 65 days from when they mailed it to you, then you can have your benefits continued while you're waiting for the decision on appeal. But same thing as far as overpayment risk goes. If the appeal is decided af, um, you know, not in your favor and they, the, the appeal says that your disability ends, um, and you're not able to get the benefits anymore, then you would have to have an overpayment for that 
the continued benefits. Um, the other thing to know for the time limits is that Social Security, of course, recognizes that problems occur and people can't always meet these time limits for some reason or another. So you can demonstrate what's called good cause for a late appeal. Um, so, and that can be circumstances like you didn't get the notice or um, you had to be hospitalized for a while or you know, some, something else occurred that prevented you from being able to file your appeal in a on a timely basis. Um, the reason I wanna make sure I bring this up is because a lot of people miss the timeline or miss the deadline and then give up. You don't wanna give up. Social Security does grant a good cause for late appeals on a regular basis. Um, and you wanna follow through with your appeals as best you can to avoid having to either reapply or having a huge overpayment. Okay, next slide, Kevin. Um, so there are several different levels of appeals. The first is called the request for reconsideration. At that stage, you can receive continued benefits as described before. If you get denied at the reconsideration level, you can request a hearing with an administrative law judge. Same timelines as I described um, previously, um, you can request that the benefits keep getting paid to you while your ALJ hearing is uh, pending. Uh, if you get a, a denial at the administrative law judge level, then you can go to what's called the appeals council review. Um, at the appeals council review, unfortunately, you're no longer able to get your benefits paid to you while you're waiting for a decision. So that can be a bit of a problem for people because you're also not allowed to reapply while you're case is pending at the Appeals Council. So keep that in mind. Um, and then if the Appeals Council denies your appeal, you can also take it to federal district court. At that point, you can put in a new application again, and you're not able to get continued benefits during the federal district court review either. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so you can file your appeals either by phone to the main social security line here or your local office number. You can send it by fax to your local office. Uh, you can go to your local office in person or you can mail in an appeal, but you've noted, you might notice here I've written in all caps, not recommended. I never recommend sending social security mail. They, they get a huge amount of mail and it's very, very hard for them to keep up with it. So if you send something to them in the mail, it's very likely that they will not see it for a really, really long time. Um, so for you to protect yourself, the best thing to do is either bring it in person, call them or um, fax it to them with a fax confirmation, and then call a week later to follow up to make sure that they received your fax. Next slide, please. Okay, so then the last little piece I wanted to go over is um, the SSI reinstatement. So SSI is a little bit different again from SSDI. If you lose SSI for a Oh, I'm sorry, this should say non-medical reason for a financial reason. <laughs> I apologize, there's a mistake there. If your SSI is terminated for a financial reason, so you have too much in resources, too much in earnings, um, you have unearned income, um, or you've been incarcerated, something like that, then um, you can, thank you, Kevin, thank you, perfect. Um, so you can have your SSI reinstated 12 months, within 12 months from the effective date of your termination, as long as you demonstrate that that financial circumstance has changed. So this comes up a lot with people who have resources greater than the $2,000 limit. What you might end up doing is spending it down, keeping all of your receipts, and then you can go to social security with your receipts and with your most recent bank statement or you know whatever kind of documentation of whatever asset it was, and you can show them, okay, I know I had more than $2,000 in resources at you know, whatever day it was, but then I spent it and now I have less than the $2,000 resources. Please start my SSI benefits up again. They will process that paperwork and reinstate your benefits as long as you are within 12 months of the effective date of your termination. After that 12 month time has um expired, then you have to do a full new SSI application where you have to demonstrate medical and non-medical eligibility all over again. So if you do have resources or some other issue that comes up that results in your SSI stopping for a financial reason, 
you know, make sure that you take care of it within that 12 months and get to social security with the proof so that you can get your benefits reinstated without having to do the full new application again and go through that whole process. Okay, I think that's the end. Uh, Kevin, can you go to the next slide just to confirm? Yes, that's the end of my presentation. And now uh, hopefully we still have a little bit of time, yes, for some questions. Um, and just again, as a reminder, as, as David mentioned at the beginning, I can give general information. I'm not able, unfortunately, to answer very specific questions about certain circumstances, but I will ask um, Kevin, if you wanna just pull up the slide again with NILAG's contact information, um, then you know, if anybody has really specific questions, you can certainly reach out to um, NILAG, all right? Thank you very much, Rachel, for this very, very, I mean, you put a huge amount of material that you've covered in a very short period of time. Um, this is everyone's opportunity to review what Rachel has uh, presented, ask any questions that you have. Uh, and now I want to present Barry Langer. Um, Barry Langer is a very active retiree who has very nicely uh, agreed to work with us. Um, he will be heading up our Q&A. Uh, place your question in the chat. Uh, we will be reviewing them and Barry is going to be asking Rachel your questions. So take it away, Barry. Well, great presentation, Rachel. And there were a couple of questions and I think you have kind of asked them, answered them as you went along, but um, I'll bring up a couple. And then I had some, which may also be things that you presented in the slides, but I think maybe worth having discussed again. Um, somebody has had trouble. They were in a waiver situation, problems contacting or getting responses back from uh, Social Security. And I think it's what you said. I think the best ways, it's not clear how Jermaine's tried to reach them, but I think you're suggesting fax and phone calls is the best way yeah. to go. And going in person, actually yeah. showing up. So again, right. And this is something I'll put in the materials that, that um, get sent out too. This is a really, really common problem. Um, again, sort of, sort of just like with the mail, Social Security, is a huge agency, they get a lot of contact and the people that work there don't get a lot of time to work on stuff. So that means that sometimes your materials can get lost in the shuffle um, and you have to do a lot of follow-up to make sure that it's actually being addressed. Um, what I recommend is frequent calls to your local office. So that's you know once a week or a couple times a week. You can go in person as well to follow up and make sure that they have your paperwork. And if you're in a situation where it's you know, been a, a couple of months and no one is responding to you at all, you can contact um, the Social Security Regional Affairs Office. They are in charge of public communications and trying to get field offices to respond to people when there's really been a, um, a delay. You do also need to keep in mind that Social Security does have a time frame for reviewing paperwork. So it might take them up to 30 days to get through your paperwork. When you send them something, your first priority should be to contact them to confirm that they have it and that someone has it to work on. And then you just wanna follow up periodically to make sure that it is being worked on and there's nothing that they need from you. Um, but again, if you're getting past that 30 day time frame and still nothing has happened, I would reach out to the regional affairs office, which I will, that'll be in the materials that I send. Excellent. And I had a question or a thought as a general theme, and then you did cover it, but I just may ask you to go over it one last time, which is keeping good records seems to be critical. And in yeah. terms of that, in terms of records of communication, you mentioned faxes, other, other ways to keep good records of the communications you've had. Yeah. So <laughs> uh, faxes are a great way because you get the, your fax confirmation. In person is also a great way because they will make a copy while you're there and give you back your original stamped with a date and time for when you got, brought it to them. Um, I do know people also like to send certified mail. That is a record of when you sent it to them, um, but certified mail is very expensive and it doesn't, they don't open certified mail any faster than their regular mail. So you have your proof that it got to them, but that still doesn't mean that they're actually processing it any faster. Um, I would say faxes do get processed faster. Um, and I know faxes can also be expensive because if you have to you know, go to your pharmacy and, have, and pay for it that way or go to um, Kinko's or something, it can be a dollar a page. 
So if that's the circumstance, I would bring it in person so that Social Security will make the copy for you and you don't have to pay for it. Excellent. I just noticed a question. Uh, can green card holders apply for SSI or SSD? Uh, yes, green card holders um, can apply for either program or both. Um, it just depends, again, on your work history, if you'll be eligible. And then also for SSI benefits, you will ultimately, you can only receive SSI benefits as a, a lawful permanent resident for, I think it's up to seven, I can't remember exactly, it's time limited, so that they, they want you to move towards applying for citizenship. But certainly green card holders can do those applications um, to see if you're eligible medically. Um, you mentioned facts. Um, is that easily readable, uh, reads easily obtainable, or is that yep. a resource? So that'll be in the resources as well. Um, I believe okay. currently, I believe the, the fax numbers for each local office are on the Social Security Field Office Finder. So you search, you can look by your zip code and you will find um, the fax number for your local office. But I'm, I'm just mm -hmm. gonna put this all together as one sheet to give people. Excellent. Yeah. And Barry, I just, like, Barry, I just yeah, wanted yeah. to remind everybody, um, you will be getting a, a, a packet, an email following um, today's presentation. Rachel's putting together materials and the videos will be available for you to review on the PSS website, which has been posted many times in the chat. Um, so I just wanted to make sure everybody's aware that the videos will be available. I know this video, the, the previous video is not yet up, but both of them will be up in the next couple of weeks and you should be getting the packet um, very shortly, um, the email uh, confirmation um, very shortly. So um, just look for, look for that in your, in your email and you can always, if you don't get it, you can always email us back um, and let us know and we'll send it out to you. I just have one more general question for me and then any other, if any, and then more questions and from the audience, if you have them. But um, of course, we talked about what I would consider the top line tips as in terms of how to communicate and records are so important. Is there any other, like you would call insider great advice that you'd want to highlight the takeaways from for the audience? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I don't have any great insights. <laughs> for mm -hmm. it's, it's hard to communicate with social security. I think my overall main advice is don't be discouraged. Um, I know people can have really negative experiences when they're communicating with social security. Um, you can feel really judged. You can feel like you've done something you know, terrible. Um, don't let that discourage you. You're, uh, you're receiving these benefits because you need them, because you're, you, know, you were eligible at, at some point, you might still be eligible, even if there is a termination event. Um, and you have the right to appeal it and to make sure that Social Security has looked at everything correctly. Um, so don't be discouraged, follow through with your appeals and um, you make sure that you keep all of your records and don't mail them, don't mail them things. <laughs> Those are my insider tips. Awesome. <laughs> well, so Dave, yeah, it doesn't okay, back to you, David, was what I was gonna say, go ahead. It does not look like we have any other additional questions uh, in the chat. I just wanted to thank Rachel and Nilag for uh, this, two, this wonderful two-part series. Uh, I wanted to thank Kevin and PSS as well um, for their continued support and seamless hosting of our um, Chat with the Expert uh, webinars. And I wanted to call everyone's attention to the upcoming uh, presentations that we have. Um, on Wednesday, September 21st, we're kicking off a three-parter. Uh, this is Medicaid eligibility part one, age 65 plus and people with disabilities. Um, and it's basically explained how Medicaid and Medicare are different. Um, and then we have a wonderful opportunity October 4th to actually um, hear from Adult Protective Services. They're gonna come and answer all your questions and review with you what Adult Protective Services is mandated with, um, what's the referral process, eligibility requirements and available services. And then on the 12th, we have healthcare navigating, navigation for seniors. This is anyone that is interested in either that has, needs to sign up for healthcare, wants to switch healthcare, or is having problems with healthcare. Um, 
they're going to come and speak about that with us. So we have we have uh, wonderful uh, presentations coming up as we have. Thank you for participating with us as you always do. And we look forward to seeing you um, in the fall. And everybody have a wonderful uh, day. Don't let the rain get you down. Keep, keep, be persistent. Take care, everybody. David, before we leave, we have oh, yes. one last question. Oh, we do. Yes. Yeah, I did see it, but I was wondering if this could maybe just like a question that should go directly contact NILAG. What does is, what is a person do when SSI or SSDI has been terminated temporarily? So again, you want to appeal it as soon as you can, um, and you certainly should contact NILAG or another legal services agency to see if they can assist you um, with your appeal. Uh, don't miss your deadline because you're waiting to talk to a lawyer though. File your appeal as soon as you can to make sure that you, that, um, you get it in on time. And you can file the appeal online, by phone, um, or by fax, uh, or in person, or by mail technically. Ra Thank Rachel, you so much for bearing with me with my sniffles. Rachel, <laughs> can I just ask as a follow-up to that, do you yeah. recommend people to get a, um, help in doing these appeals or should they do it themselves? Should they have their neighbor help them? How should they actually go about doing that? Um, you so Social Security does have a mandate to assist people with paperwork. Um, so Social Security is supposed to help you in completing the paperwork. <laughs> Uh, but for an appeal, really, there's not much that you need to do to make sure that it's in on time. There's usually just a one page form that you can fill out to get it actually in on time. And then they might send you additional forms that you need to complete. So do your best on your own, um, or you can have somebody help you, or you can, you can speak with a lawyer, of course, to help you. Um, but I just want to be sure, especially for people who are at risk of losing SSDI, you have a really short time frame to appeal. You have that 10 days to be able to appeal and keep your benefits. So you want to be sure that you get your appeal in on time. Um, and, you know, the, the what you put on the actual form is not really going to be, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, that's not like set in stone. So if you think of something else, or if the lawyer that you talk with thinks, thinks of some other reason for why this appeal is, should be filed, you can always add that later. That's fine. Thank you again, Rachel. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day. See you all Thanks. next time. I'll chat with the expert.